Just more than a month ago, world-famous scientist Professor Stephen Hawking visited South Africa for the first time. One of our new specialists, Professor David Block, had the exclusive privilege of getting the only interview he gave during his visit. And what he had to say is somewhat controversial and may come as a surprise to many. Meet him after the break. This is our home, and many of us just drift through life, busying ourselves with our own day-to-day -day survival. Some individuals, however, have dedicated their lives and their research in trying to understand how our universe came about and what its future holds for us. Many would cite Albert Einstein as one of the greatest scientists of all time. But will there be another such genius? Earlier this year, some of the world's most eminent scientists descended on the seaside resort of Musenberg to support an initiative to find an African Einstein. Where would the planet's foremost scientists choose to meet the public? At the Musenberg Pavilion. Let us go inside. Amongst the stellar personalities attending was the administrator of NASA, Michael Griffin. Headed for the surface of Mars, after landing and bouncing a couple of dozen times, the spacecraft came to a rest. The airbags deflated. This is an actual photograph of the spacecraft taken from itself as it sets out uh, across the sands of Mars. Next was Nobel Physics Laureate David Gross, who revolutionized our understanding of atoms and their nuclei. Most of the universe is made of stuff that we don't know, that we can indirectly infer from the motion of stars and galaxies or from the expansion of the universe. Dark matter is 90% of the matter in the universe, but it's not the stuff that we are made of, some new kind of matter. George Smurt won his Nobel Physics Prize for mapping the early universe in which galaxies later formed. And then you get more and more mature galaxies, but then we have this mysterious dark energy that's causing the universe to accelerate. So let me show you how this looks when you sort of go outside of it and look back. And you'll see a very interesting feature here called the Great Wall. And one of the things that we speculate about is how probable is something like this Great Wall of Galaxies. And the world's best known living scientist, cosmologist Stephen Hawking, who helped prove mathematically that the universe must have had a beginning. Hawking suffers from Logierig's disease, which restricts him to only communicate by moving a cheek muscle that sends messages to a voice synthesizer connected to his computer. We showed that the universe couldn't bounce. If Einstein's general theory of relativity is correct, there will be a singularity, a point of infinite density in space-time curvature, where time has a beginning. A packed audience, 800 people. The interest was so intense, the excitement was so high that I understand that the public and some scientists actually stood and broke down a door. A surprise to Benny was Stephen Hawking's relationship with Pip Witter, a former cabinet minister who met Hawking in Cambridge in the 1990s. But what was it that attracted the world's top scientists to the humble little suburb of Musenberg, where the previous most historic occasion was when Darwin landed in 1836? What was once a very old and dilapidated hotel is now Ames, the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences. It is a building where the next Einstein of tomorrow on the continent of Africa is being raised. Ames was founded by mathematical physics professor Neil Turok, the son of Musenberg MP professor Ben Turok. Neil had been working with Stephen Hawking in Cambridge when he decided that Africa could be the place to seek out a future science genius. What does it take for a South African in Cambridge to persuade the world's greatest scientist with his disability in coming all this way, what brings Stephen here? Well, maybe people in South Africa don't realize uh, the esteem with which the country is held worldwide. It was a very easy case to make because Stephen has been following uh, the progress in South Africa for years. He's a huge admirer of Mandela. He's written to Mandela. There's this uh, connection with Pick Botha. 
So I just go to him and I say, I'd like to uh, want to start an institute mm. in South Africa for mm. attracting students from all over Africa, mm. the best lecturers from the world. Uh, will you support us? Yes. And he said, of course I will. Neil believes that these students at AIM should be supported in what they are trying to achieve for this continent. It's very simple. You've got to look for opportunities. What opportunities are there yes. in Africa yes. which have been missed? Well, the first one is the very bright people. So they can have successful careers in Africa because they're the ones who will figure out the solutions, who then presidents and ministers will see, wow, we can have brilliant people in Africa. You build self-confidence and a sort of a can-do spirit, and that's the way to do it. With the support of Neil Turok, 5050 was able to secure the only interview with Stephen Hawking during his visit to South Africa. Joining us on the interview was Pick Wurter. Professor Hawking, an issue we didn't discuss during our first meetings uh, has been this one. Is the present observable universe the first universe? The universe seems to have begun in a Big Bang about 14 billion years ago. All the evidence is consistent with the universe having been spontaneously quantum created out of nothing at the Big Bang, so there would be no earlier universe. This would be the only universe of which we have knowledge. That's one of Stephen's greatest contributions, is that the universe has had a definite beginning mm -hmm. and simply not the result of a bounce, but the beginning of the cosmos. We also wanted to know whether a planet under similar conditions as ours could produce life, even in a primitive form. We believe that life arose spontaneously on the Earth, so it must be possible for life to appear on other suitable planets, of which there seem to be a large number in the galaxy, but we don't know how life first appeared. The probability of something as complicated as a DNA molecule being formed by random collisions of atoms in a primeval ocean is incredibly small. Still, even if the probability of life appearing on a suitable planet is very small, since the universe is infinite, life would have appeared somewhere. We don't seem to have been visited by aliens, and we haven't picked up any of their television signals, so the next advanced civilization is at least a few hundred light years away, and maybe in another galaxy. So indeed, uh, Puck, we are in a lonely spot, as we've heard from Stephen. The universe might have primitive life forms zooming in all over the place, but I think what Stephen is really saying is that advanced life is a very unique process. But it didn't rule it out. That's correct, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Now, I understand your third question, Pick, yeah. really delves into the heart of what might be on the minds of millions of viewers. What happens to human self-consciousness when one dies? I imagine what happens to human consciousness when we die is much like turning off a computer. I don't believe in a heaven for computers. I think the afterlife is a fairy story for people afraid of the dark. <laughs>